I thought it would be fun again to have this was another one of the I've kind of picked and choose some of the comments that I saw that were kind of the most grandma <laughs> type comments. So we'll play another one for you here and uh, let me know Ram. what you think at the end. Yes, let me see it. Loved every minute of the mound visit as usual, but this segment really meant really very special sharing stories of very special people. Fathers, Jason, need to hear your treasured memories about your dad and Casey as well as with his dad. Hope you enjoyed your day, Jason, and I love your hair. Girls die for that curl. Not to say they don't for Casey's thick wavy hair. Loved the show. Got me melancholy with startup of the show and then the Field of Dreams movie. Think it's probably everyone's baseball favorite. Love hearing your experiences, Jason, especially changing teams in mid-season. Talk about stress. You got to be ready for change at the drop of a dime almost. Wow. Enjoy your week. Looking forward to next week's show. Sounds exciting. How about that? That's we my favorite bring, one. We need to bring her on, dude. We need to have a mound visit with Grandma, dude. Seriously. This turtle that I saved, I almost ran over. We might have talked about this. <laughs> so the kids are all out. I don't think so. No. So I was driving no, over I... this, this place. Like uh, this was like this was like months ago. This was like maybe in the fall, right? Maybe in mm -hmm. November, late November. Almost run over this huge box turtle in the middle of the street. I stopped because I was like, "Holy shit, this thing's huge!" I stopped. I turn around. Another car is coming. I'm like, "Oh, like inches." This thing. Could have got smashed. I scoop them up. Ooh. I put them in the floor. You know, I'm like, oh, I got a pond, right? The farm. We're, we're better to put them, save them, rescue them. Nothing's going to happen, right? So the kids are out. Fast forward to last night. Kids are out up on the land. They're looking for deer sheds. And don't you know they find the turtle shell? And I'm like, where? where? <laughs> I was like, wait, the guy died. He must have been ripped to smithereens because I'm like, a turtle doesn't like, change its shell right i don't Especially think so would yeah. so i'm like a hawk or something had to have gotten the poor wow. guy but uh i got carcasses everywhere i got cow cow hides i got a, a bull steer horns and now i got the turtle sitting on my counter i mean like <laughs> so the, que the question bro. is the question is did you really save the turtle because it seems like you might have expedited I it. Shot at life. I gave him a shot at life. Like, here's land. There's less trucks. You know? You could have been yeah. either smashed. I don't know. It's like saying, would you rather burn or would you rather drown? The turtle's like, yeah, would you that's... rather get smashed by a car or chances of hiding the weeds and getting pecked out by vultures and whatever else is out there that's looking for a turtle soup for the day? You know? Speaking of meals, that was Super Bowl Sunday. So, you know? Turtle. <laughs> Turtle soup. Somebody had turtle uh, soup. I don't know up if, there. If, if we learned if we've learned That's anything not on from Guy Fieri's like, menu. No, no. Guy Fieri was at the Super Bowl. I know. He made an he, appearance. He, uh, he gave me a buzz. Dude. He gave me a little text, and uh, I said, "You're rock and roll." I wish I was out that tailgate. That spread was probably interesting and amazing. But I'm gonna try to catch him in June. He's coming to Ohio across the border, so maybe. You, Maybe you come out, we'll uh, sneak attack and go across and check out what he's got going there. I think it's a Brett Michaels event or something, something crazy. It's always a fun nice. time. It's whatever it is. Yep. Hey, I'm and, sure. Uh, we're excited though to have, you know, we didn't do hair and makeup this morning, but I wonder if our guy, their big broadcaster, the Atlanta native himself, the beloved Jeff Francoeur is coming on to join us today. I'm pretty excited about my old teammate, uh, mm -hmm. the great clubhouse guy. We had a lot of 
A lot of chuckles, a lot of yucks. Um, and a, and a difficult season. And uh, yeah. I can't wait to not drum up old bad stories. But that's kind of what you do, you know. The, the, the ones that sting a little bit, the ones that are emotional. We won five games in April. He and I were the last two in the clubhouse. So I'm going to pick his brain mm. so you can see the lens that I'm not just lying on mound visit. You know, I got validation of having an old teammate back up some of these, these old stories. But, uh... <laughs> I hey, I think uh, I, I think it's cool too. Especially, I I always find it interesting when you know you have players and you know they end up becoming those those media personalities for their their former teams that they played with. I mean, I remember earlier when we talked to Lenny DiNardo and he works for the Red Sox now at 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 Nesson, yep. and um, it's cool to see to see Frank, uh, Jeff Frank core doing that too. And, you know, I got to watch him as a Met for a year, uh, which was fun. And, uh, he's, you know, great player and hard to, I mean, it's hard to say which one he's better at because he's a phenomenal broadcaster as well. And, uh, you know, oh, obviously dude, he's, such a, he's, he's a pro, obviously the Braves aren't yeah. my favorite, but he he's, he's good to listen to. He does a really, really, really good job. Well, he was a very good teammate. He was always, Yucking it up in the dugout, keeping things loose. He's just a good person, great, great fun guy to be around, man. And you know, he's he's. I think he's living his dreams, dream job. You know, I'm not only that. Yeah. He got to live it in a Braves uniform, um, team that he grew up and admired. But man, now to now to talk baseball and get paid talking about a game that he's got the bird's eye view. It it was cool because I I got to see him a couple times and. I'm envious because I, I'd love to do that. I had a job to do it with uh, Toronto right after mm. my career, but just timing timing wasn't right, you know. I had to pass on a golden opportunity. Um, but a lot of work goes into that, traveling around and watching baseball mm -hmm. in Toronto would have been not a terrible thing. But I got two guys that I'd rather watch. I was going to say, that's uh, – it the the grind of that schedule is real um travel into every game and uh but but you but it's like you said that is the dream especially for someone like you know someone like myself who didn't get to play baseball at the highest level because uh you know for factors that you know de definitely weren't um because i you know only threw like 85 miles an hour but uh the uh Getting to talk about baseball for a living is just about as good as it gets. If you, if you can't have that, you know, for you, it's like if you can't play forever, might as well talk about it for the rest of my life. And then, you yeah, know, you for someone who – about there's, Exactly. Yeah. There's it's as jobs, good as it gets. There's jobs in, on, on, or all around sports. We'll be right back to this week's episode of Mound Visit. But before we do that – we want to let you know that another stop has been added to the Stadium Series Tour. The Top 100 Experience is coming to Buffalo, New York for a two-day showcase event. This stop on the tour is an exclusive recruiting event for the 15 to 17 U age groups only. The Top 100 Experience is a high-powered, multi-day event in a professional setting that helps you showcase your skills and talents at AAA ballparks. This is your chance to play at a professional stadium, learn from former MLB players, and compete in front of college coaches. Check out the other two stops on the tour as well, PNC Field in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and NBT Bank Stadium in Syracuse, New York. All three of these events have limited space available, so make sure you sign up now. For more information, visit the Top 100 Sports website and click on the Top 100 Experience page, or click the link in the description of this video. Now let's get back to the episode. Well, Frenchie, thanks for coming on, man. This is my boy Case. Well, We've just been uh, doing the show for a little bit and um, having former friends, former guests, and um, yeah. you know, you're a pro yeah. at, at what you're doing. And what a dream, dream life you've lived, man. So far, you're still around the game. That's what we were just talking about before you joined us here, man. With just you know how to be a native. You, know, you were a native of, of Atlanta, got to play yeah. for your beloved Braves growing up, and now broadcasting and here on Mount Visit. I mean, does it get any better than that, dude? <laughs> no, it doesn't. You're right. It doesn't. Not at all. <laughs> I I, I want to ask because I, I think this is – we can kind of jump right in. Um, I've, I've been dying to – especially 
Super Bowl was last night. I'm ready to get to baseball season right now. So yeah. this is a perfect time uh, uh, to have you on here. Um, but we'll start right off with the Braves because, you know, that that's who you talk about every day. Um, but I think it's interesting because we can draw the comparison to football where you look at what the the Kansas City Chiefs have done and the dynasty that they've built, how good they've been over the last few years. And you could say the same thing about the Braves, but they just it's that last hump that they've had to get uh, to get over, which they haven't done quite yet. I mean, they did win that World Series in 21, obviously. That's a that's a massive accomplishment, but no, for sure. Um I I think I saw an interesting quote in an article that you said um, about the Braves in October specifically, and you said they can't just can't just be nice guys. You got, I mean, there's that extra thing that they got to find. Can you explain that a little bit? Because I found that very interesting. Well, you know what's funny is I went on with uh, AJ Przezinski and those guys last week, and that's I basically said you need an AJ on your team. You need an a hole, right? <laughs> Someone that uh, you know is just that way. And it's 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 funny when you think about it because. You know, it, it, it's so true. I, I'm not saying you got to be the mean team. You got to be the bad news bears and, you know, just kind of meet up with those guys, you know, and be that way. It's it's more of, you know, for me, I think you have to have the ability to have guys that have, have some edge and, you know, are able to to motivate, right? Like, you, baseball is such a weird thing because it's a 162-game season, as, as, as Jason can tell you. I mean, there's plenty of nights you're just going to lose. And, and you know, are you happy? No. But you take a shower, you eat your meal, and you go home. You know, you, you could be the best team in baseball, and let's be honest, you're going to lose six, at least 60 games a year. And so right. it's such a good thing. But when you get to the postseason, man, it's all momentum. And, you know, if you lose that first game, all of a sudden you put all the pressure in the world on yourself to win the second game. Because if you go down 2 nothing, the best of five, good chance it's over. So it's just such a different beast. That's why I always say it's not football, right? Like, you can get off to a bad start in football. Look at the Chiefs. Last three Super Bowls, all time, all three have been double-digit down. Yep. But they have time to let the defense settle in, to let, you know, the offense get going. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's such, a di- it's such a different way of thinking. But, you know, it, it's true. You, you have to have guy like Bryce Harper was that guy for the Phillies, right? Like, they fed off that. They started making shirts that said, attaboy. And people ask me, and I'm like, it's not a big deal. Well, they turned it into a big deal, and it became, you know, something huge. I, I, that, that's such a – it's interesting because I think the best teams, the best players always find that little – that extra edge. Whether or not – like you said, whether that attaboy was meant to spark anything, it did, and it was used yeah. to fuel that. So I think that that – it's interesting that that is – Well, you know, it – doesn't you know, matter funny. the sport, but yeah, go ahead. You know, it was funny. I say, you know, we you consider AJ our a hole of our team that we played on in 2015, which you know was a hard season, brother. Uh, he wasn't enough of an a hole for, like, for us. We only won five games in April, if you remember. And you and I were just standing there. I remember sitting in my locker, <laughs> feeling wow. embarrassed to be a brave at that time because we won five games. Wow. We were on pace. You said 60 games. We were on pace to win 30, so you do the math. <laughs> that wasn't a good season. We were, all the, we were all on the chopping block three weeks in, put it that way. Wow. Yeah, yeah, when your manager's ducking out early, I think he was like, I got to get out of here. You know, and we were like, me and you were sitting there. We didn't want to shower. We're like, maybe we just hang out here a little bit longer because then they won't get rid of us. We cared. <laughs> the most that we sit there. That was tough. But in, in all seriousness, to the point circling back on, you know, getting there at the end, the more champs you get into the playoffs, uh, the better chance you have to, to win, obviously, once you get and hopefully catch fire. But here, i gotta, I got to make this point. I make it so many times. People don't realize, and I don't like the way Major League Baseball has set up this tournament now because the Braves, the three best teams, had too much time off. You play 162. It's hard. Your body's hurting. Mentally, you're exhausted. You can't wait to go home. you got all these plans people asking for tickets, all these pressures that people don't know about. They cannot have such a lapse of time. The best teams are sitting there for seven, eight days. You can't turn that switch on and off, and I believe that's what happens. That's why these wild cards are, are going further, I believe. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree, and it's it's tough. And the other thing, you know, that that's not talked about enough, 
reseed, man. Like, football's got it right with that. If you're the number one seed, you know, yeah. if you're the Braves in there, why do they not get to play the Diamondbacks last year? Why do they have to play the Phillies? You know, you, you, you right. had the best record all year. And that's why I said, you know, football, God, more than basketball, more than baseball, is just so ahead of the times with that stuff. And I, I don't understand why you can't jump on board with that. Like, it's not a big deal. You know, you, it's the home team's hosting no matter what. It's not like you need time to prepare. You know, you just don't know if you're playing who's playing who. But, like, that happened. Think about it in the NFL this year. Like, the Niners were the number one seed. You know, the Packers, as a seven seed, beat um, – God, who the heck did they beat again? Cowboys. Cowboys, Cowboys. yeah. Sorry, sorry to Cowboys fans. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but they beat the Cowboys, and so now all of a sudden you have to – if you're San Fran, you're switching. You know, you're preparing yourself probably, you know, to play, you know, the uh, not the Lions because they won, but whoever the four or five seed, and all of a sudden you're just totally switching. So – I, I don't understand why you can't reseed to. And and I, I agree, man. If you're going to give that layoff, Jason, which I, I don't think that's going away because the amount of teams that are getting in the playoffs and the money that's being made, then make it a best of seven series. Make it to where, hey, you know what? You lose game one, it ain't the end of the world. Plenty of time right. to 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 get back and, and do. And and that's it's two extra games or three extra games. It ain't gonna hurt a schedule. Hell, it'll make some more money, you know what I mean, which is what the yeah, orders right? are all about. And to, to us yep. at that point, you know, you know it as a player, how you may get there and never get there again. So the chances of trying to win is so essential and so important, moreover than even what ownership, I think, sometimes feels because you're down there in the grind and, um, you know, heck, you watch it every day now, right, instead of playing it, but you know how hard it is and, you know – Guys of aches and pains and are going out there giving it, giving it their, giving it their all uh, for a chance to win that ring one time, and you know. Yeah, and, and then they try to. Yeah, and they try to say like those five days are going to really help you rest. Like, come on, dude, when you go 162, you're banged up until you go to Mexico for a week and drink margaritas, and you're feeling okay. <laughs> all right. I, I, I was going to ask as because that's something that that really always brings up and. Uh, specifically with that uh, the rest time for that for the number one seed and and Come I want to know because it, it's interesting and I think that you could even expand on that too because a lot of people probably don't understand how significant that layoff is when you've already played 162 and I think the thing that Grilly always says is like your body whether you are trying to do it or not you could do as many simulated at bats and games your body just starts to shut down do you agree with that too Oh, for sure. And look, yeah. in football, you want that rest, man. You're right, exactly. banging for 17 weeks. Like, to get a week where you don't have to hit somebody and get smoked, that's huge for them. But in baseball, like, once you get going, you know, we, we say it all the time. You, you take the all-star break off for four days, man. You come back Friday night for game one. You're first to bat. You feel foreign. It's just weird <laughs> because you haven't, you haven't swung. And now think about for some of these pitchers, maybe a, maybe a reliever – that hasn't pitched in eight days and all of a sudden you're going into a big game, you know, in the playoffs and you're supposed to, to be able to hit corners and jam guys like that ain't going to happen. And so that, that's why I said, there's, there's gotta be a better way somewhere there. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Again, my whole thing is they're not, they're not going to shorten the time because of what's going on. So to me, just make it a best of seven right off the bat after that. Well, hey, if, yeah. they ask, if they ask you or me or some players, I mean, get them involved. This is why I think, and I don't know why. I mean, yes, we go into broadcasting. We get on back on the field into coaching and pitching coaches and bench coaches and managers, right? Any way we can get back into the game, stay around it for guys that want to do that. I, I feel like I don't know why the front office has such a, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, but saying what not, but I sit there and I go, come on, man, this is why you need somebody like, me or you or anybody that like cares about the game that can go in between a business mindset and to give the perspective of, hey, man, you know, this is the soap they need to put in the crack of their ass to make them stay on point. You know, have a feel for both court awareness on what it is. But for some reason, there's that division between ownership and management. And, hey, you know, we did it. So we're just giving you a perspective. We're giving you more information, which is a, we're in an information age of baseball which is like, these are the intangible things that we go, hey, this is just feel. 
guys. They're not robots down there. They're played by human beings. And these type of things matter if you guys want to win championships. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, Grilly, you can say it best, too, because you're around forever. It's the idea that it's like the player Association is supposed to hate the owners so much. And they, they try to make this thing where it's like, look, of course there's going to be disagreements, but let's come alongside to make the game the best we can make. Players are going to get paid. Owners are going to get paid. There's a lot of money going around. I mean, I, I, I sit here in Atlanta, guys, and watch 41000 every night at the battery spending money on boot. Like, the players for the Braves are $220 million payroll. So everything's going in the right direction. So I, I couldn't agree more. It, it's such a, like, you know, it's like, oh, Manfred's coming. Don't, you know, nobody wants him in the locker room. Like, no, come on down. Say hi to the teams. And let guys for 15 minutes, maybe maybe chew your ear off for a minute. Maybe you get an idea, not, hey, if there's anybody with this, don't talk to them. I, I just, I don't, I, it, right? Like, my wife tells me all yeah, the time right. in our marriage, right? When our marriage goes bad, it's because we're not communicating, <laughs> right? Like, let's be that's honest, good. with four kids <laughs> doing it. And, and that's the thing. Like, if we spend Sunday nights a lot of time mapping out the week, you got this kid, this activity, doing this. Usually goes pretty smoothly. Hey, listen, I'm that's not a, married such anymore. A good, that's such married. a good point. I have not married anymore, but I saw this greatest thing down there for couples therapy. They were doing rock, paper, scissors, but they put a pillowcase. I just saw it on Instagram. They put a pillowcase. They started with, like, flour and all that stuff. And if you lose, they just smash their head in there, and the couple's laughing. It's like, yeah, that's, that's how it could be. So get Manfred. You know, let's go, Manfred. We're going to go on the still. We're changing the playoffs. If you do this, rock, paper, scissors, boom, let's go. I, it, it's interesting, and I, I you know, because you kind of brought up, you know, about making the game the best that it that it could be. And I think that, that to an extent, there was really an effort to try and do that this past season. And I think also to an extent, they kind of succeeded with some of those rule oh. changes. Can you touch on, because it's something that Grilly and I talk about a lot, but can you touch on maybe some of the things that you enjoyed about uh, you know, some of those efforts to evolve the game that they, that they brought into place this year? Everything. I mean, you couldn't have found a better fan. I remember doing a game where the, I think the Braves beat the Reds like 11-9 in Cincinnati, and it was two hours and 42 minutes. And I'm like... <laughs> This game last year is three hours oh. and 52. At the, least, bar's yeah. closed, the bar's closed at the hotel by the time I get back. You know, you got <laughs> nothing to do. And and so, but, you know, but there's a perfect example, right? Like, all the players were for it. You talk to majority of them. 95% were for it. But the Players Association want to make it sound like, oh, we're totally against this because it was the owner's ideas. And I'm like... Man, I, I'm convinced you brought some fans back in baseball because, you know, I know my kids. My wife would usually bring my kids to a game to watch because, you know, they're huge Braves fans. And and by the fifth inning, you know, it's 930. And she's like, we got school tomorrow. Got, we got to go. And now it's like, hey, it's 930. We're in the eighth inning. Okay, let's let's finish this game if it's a good game. So I was all for it, man. I, you know, the base is being bigger. I, I didn't really care either way. I'm like, either run, don't run, right? I mean, right. I think there's kind of a mixed bag on that one as far as the the stat show, you know, because I, still, I think it's, a lot of people still tried to steal. I don't know what it did, but the pace of play was, was so Phenomenal. nice, man. It, it really was. Like, you know, just in, in long games, you got doing that, so – I loved everything about it. The one thing I don't want to come in, which I know it's going to, is the automated strike zone. Mm. I just, it's not going to. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. I don't like it, man. And I, and I get, man, there's times you're like, oh, gosh, but that, isn't that what makes it fun? The arguing. Yes. It's like, you know, now you're going to have yeah, sure. this umpire back there. Just, I mean, if you do that, there's literally zero reason to have umpires now. I mean, honestly, right. like, like Stick a robot, they can just right? tell you. It's it's interesting because I, I think that from watching it, because I, I live eight minutes away from the uh, the AAA stadium for the Mets here in Syracuse. And so I've got, they do it, there's like, when they have a six-game homestand, I think it's like every other, like maybe three out of the six games, they, they'll test out that automated strike zone. It's, I, I get it from the, 
from the just the fundamental standpoint of it where yeah it's technically a robot up there that's yeah. that's calling the shots but it's cool because i i think personally watching it and seeing the way that it flo- like you almost don't notice it where unless you're really paying attention where you know pitch comes in batter doesn't agree tap the helmet or the catcher whatever um i think they're unfortunately i think it's probably only a matter of time the way that it seems to me and the way that they're like implementing it into the game but it's just like i agree with you with the fact that part of the fun and beauty of baseball is wondering hey what if this strike call went this way what if what if you know what if he doesn't get this call arguing with the umpires has always been part of the game but now it's gonna if that happens it goes by the wayside because it's like hey man argue with the robot upstairs because i don't have a say in this so no right might be a baseballism hat, you know. No crying in baseball. Might, might that might actually happen. There's going to be no crying and, anymore. And, you know, I think, I, and every <laughs> everything I've heard, all the umpires I've talked to have have pretty much said, "Hey, it's coming." And I think one of the major reasons too is because gambling and is coming, you know, and and the idea to be able to control the narrative of, "Hey, you bet one side, this is going," and it's not so much, "Hey, this." You know, Doug Eddings is behind the plate, and I love Doug, but with Doug, you know you're getting a two-hour, 20-minute game, man. If that ball is that close, you better be. Never bothered <laughs> me because you knew I was hacking anyways, but but for people that like to zero it in, man. I love that. Okay. Talk a Speaking little of bit gambling, now. Though, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it leads into the whole, the whole Hall of Fame thing, which I think that's a whole show in itself. There were so many guys that were axed. I mean, guys that got in, unbelievable. But, you know, it brings up the gambler now. Now we're allowed to gamble, so let Pete Rose in. That's what I say. I go, if we're, we now made a concession, we let steroid users in, all these guys, all this, this Goomba talk, you know, it's, it's, it's rolling out the carpet now. There's plenty of room in Cooperstown for a lot of great players. If you have the numbers like Don Mattingly or Gary Sheffield, all these guys are on the belt that are technically worthy to be in there. I don't know why they have that cutoff, but um, yeah, the gambling and the Hall of Fame thing. Sorry, I just forked in the road for you there, but you know, again, <laughs> I love to take your take on some of the stuff that we get to catch up on on this show. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, man. And and I'm to the point, like, if, if that's a thing, put an asterisk next to some of these names, right? Like. Just, just do it and just say this was a steroid error, you know, because everybody did it. It's not, I mean, let's be honest. We both know four or five guys that are in Cooperstown that, you know, we're, we're doing we're something. There. We're, and look, we're yeah, lactating. exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm just a point. And like you said, Pete Rose never did it as a player. And he never bet against it. Look, if he bet against his team, I'd be the first to tell you, never step foot on a baseball field, minor league field, right. whatever. But it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like that was part of the deal. And I just, Hall of Fame's gotten weird. You know, one thing I loved about the Baseball Hall of Fame for years was it was so hard to get in, right? Like, yep. like you had to be one of the greatest. And there were great, great players. But now, like, you know, I'm seeing guys get in that you're like, okay, that's fine as a Hall of Famer. But then I look at it the other side – one of my former teammates, Andrew Jones, are you freaking kidding me? Oh, right. my God. Yeah. This, like, right. you can make an argument. Him and Willie Mays are the two greatest outfielders of all time defensively. Easily. And I, and I think what was the thing I saw the other day? There's only four, four, position, four position players that have ever had over 10 gold gloves and 400 home runs, and all three are in the Hall of Fame except Andrew. Yeah. I think it was what Mike Schmidt, Willie Mays. And I'm drawing, I, I'm being an idiot. I'm, I'm sure I forget the other one, but it's like. Hmm. Well, that's what it's I said. Weird. Cooperstown, you can make it bigger. That's all. It tells a story. It's weird. You know, it tells a story. It's, it's, well, it's weird the because I, it almost seems like with Cooperstown, there are certain counting stats that are like, hey, if you got this, you're a lock. But then there's others where it's like, eh, you know, and, and, and that's, that I think is the issue where. Well, I don't know. Issue might be the might be a strong word, but it, it just kind of seems like there's no clear criteria. And I guess that's part of what makes it special. But it's also because it's like, is it the best players of all time or is it just, you know, the best players of this era, this era? So, I, you know, it, there's well, no right answer. And, and I, always say, I always say give players some votes, you know, let, let oh, them yeah. slowly trickle in because yeah, it's yeah. like this. 
I, I know Billy Wagner. I faced him. That's a Hall of Famer for me. Like, <laughs> like there, there no I'll, I'll never forget. You know, I faced Trevor Hoffman a little later in his career. He didn't have the nine, but that change up, like there were three closers that I faced that like, to me, you were just new. Like for, for the longevity too. It wasn't like a three or four year deal where they were mm-hmm. really good. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, but Wagner, Rivera, Hoffman, like those guys dominated for years and years and years. And you knew when you faced him. So I'm like, why Why is he not in the Hall of Fame? Yeah. Like you ask any player that went up there and faced him in the ninth inning and they'll be like, that's a Hall of Famer if I've ever seen one. Yeah, so I, I think it's have a I, I, the Hall of really good then. They, you know, if they're yeah. not a Hall of Famer, a Hall of really freaking good because You're right. I'd go to that museum too. I would go to that museum to appreciate what these guys have done. You know, they're our fraternity brothers, and we played alongside them. And we know what they what they do, um, how great they were, how we picked their brains. Right? There was guys that I would pick their brains, even if you know, if I was the closer. And I'm going over here and asking, like, yo, what do you do and to a rookie? Yeah, they're on the other <laughs> team, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to, just trying to get better, dude. It's like you know, hey, yep. you're a great, better magician than me. Show me how you do that trick, right? It's like. It's it's a lot of pressure, bro. And you know, I'm glad I got to roll with one of the survivors here, man. We we had a good time. I was just telling Case, I was telling Case just how much we laughed. Thank God for guys like you and Johnny Gomes during that that season. I I was so proud to be a brave, embarrassed at the same time. You know, that was my experience. And uh, you know, and then to come back and 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 the Braves organization just you know how classy they are. They had me and flew me and my son out there and treated me like I was Greg Maddox. It didn't matter. If you wore that uniform, they made me feel so great and special, man. It is a prized organization, and there's no doubt, um, you know, one of the best, uh, especially the yeah, national. Well, you know what? They, you know, I grew up here in Atlanta, of course, came up with the Braves, finished my career at the Braves, and and the same thing got right back into announcing. And let me tell you, man, I was so I went up to Derek Schiller's office back in August and I was so nervous because I was basically telling him that I wanted to step back from doing 100 games because, you know, I'm in the thick of things right now with the kids, man, 10, 8, 5 and 3, wanting to coach him, wanting to be around. And, you know, it, it couldn't have gone better. I mean, they not only that, they they hey, can you stick around and do 25, 30 games, you know, home game wow. stuff? And then for the most part, let me pick which games I'm going to awesome. do and like, you know, to, to be a part of it and do that. And, and like you said, right now, man, I, I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, y'all are getting the experience I did. Cause I was about seven years old in 91 when they started that run. And I'm like, my kids have no idea what it's like to go to a game where there's only 10,000 fans and your team just is losing a hundred games. I'm like, they go to the every year now, they just go and they know it's 41,000 and you got a Cunha and these guys, I'm like, guys, it ain't like this all the time. And <laughs> no, you better enjoy it. Cause it, it'll, we all know at some point it'll turn and you're going to be like, God, I wish I could go back to those days. The loudest thing we it, heard it's crazy. in 2015 was buzzing lights. That's what we heard a lot of, a lot of the lights buzzing. Yeah. <laughs> I I want to ask you, uh, Jeff, because, you know, obviously you mentioned Acuna and the Braves have, I think what's special about them, and everybody knows this, is the the core of young, like, elite talent that they have on that roster. And Acuna is right at the center of it. So as someone who gets to, you know, watch almost all their games and see them in person, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to watch them on a day-to-day basis and what makes a guy like a Ronald Acuna Jr. or an Austin Riley, who I think is one of the most underrated players in the game, what makes them so special and you know what contribute to this core of this Braves team and why they're going to be a, a force for so long? Okay, so let's put Otani in his own category, right? right. Because the guy can throw 100 and hit bombs. So he's in his own category because I've, I've never seen anything like it. But I've said this, besides him, there's nobody that can change a game in so many different ways like Ronald Acuna can. And it's not a knock on Bryce Harper, Mike Trout, Mookie Betts. I mean, those guys are, are going to be Hall of Famers themselves, let's be honest. I said, but the difference to me is he, his legs, his power, his ability to just shoot the ball through the, you know, through the second base hole there if, if the guy's on third, like – his IQ has gotten so smart, and he's learned to play the game the right way. And I said it, having guys like Eric Young and Ron Washington 
and those guys, like, dude, they helped rein him in and say, like, look, you have the talent. You could just show up and not do anything, and you'd be one of the top ten players in the game. But you can show up, put the work in, and you're going to be one of the best players to ever play this game. And I, I said it last year, man, he stole 70-something bags, and it was like he didn't even try. I mean, it was just like for, he pretty much went on first pitches and told the pitcher and catcher, I'm running, and there's nothing you're going to do about it. You know, like it was incredible. And so, you know, I, I think that's the great thing the Braves have done is they, they do a good job of getting the young talent. They, they've kind of done this for years, man. And then they go out and they get guys when they need them. You know, it was like when I was there early on, you know, me, McCann, Kelly Johnson, you know, we all kind of came up and then they went and signed Tim Hudson, signed Derek Lowe. Like, you know, it's time, hey, we're, we're ready to make these moves. Let's go get a couple bullpen pieces, you know. And so I, I think they've always done a good job with that. And, you know, as, as, as Jason said, you know, they treat you the right way. When you when for years you had Bobby Cox, now Snit, you know, if you can't play for those guys, man, you can't play for anybody. And so, you know, my whole thing is they build a thing where it's like, hey, we want to be here. So what do they do with three years left before free agency? You go to Austin Riley, you say, here's 210 million, man, or 220. Do you want to be here for 10 years? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Freaking lootly, you know, yeah. and, and, you, and you build that. And like anything, I, I've said this and they do it a great model because they've shown now with this new stadium, if you win like this, we'll put three million fans in the seats every year. No problem. People are going to come. It's, you know, from the South weekends, you know, that's what people don't understand, man. You get families driving from Mississippi, North Florida stuff. And they'll come in for a whole weekend and watch two or three games. But if you put a good product out there, right, you're, you're going to go watch the team play. And so well, they've the done branding, a good job of being able to. Yeah. The branding, like you said, I'm, I'm keying onto that point. When I went there and I took my son to the gift shop, they had every state, Tennessee, South Carolina, Alabama, any state, Georgia, they had, the branding of the Braves logo inside the state, they encompass Braves Nation is yep. so huge. And to that point, man, that's why that place was so electric. I was telling Casey, I said, dude, you, I, know you're, I know you're a Mets fan, sorry, but you got to go down there and see that energy because it's Disneyland. They've created Disneyland of baseball. Yeah, I, I agree. And look, the bank, when I did the playoffs – Philadelphia was stupid, man. I mean, that place was absolutely, it was like, but I will tell you this, one of the loudest moments of postseason was that game two when when Riley hit that ball mm -hmm. down the left field line and that place went absolutely insane. So that's a great thing, right? Like, you love it. Philly, Atlanta, like the rivalries, this and that. Like, that's that's one thing, you know, you hear a lot of people talking. I said, that those two teams right there, man, they're going to post up for about another three, four years when you look at the talent. And there's going to be some battles there. Yeah, unfortunately for my Mets fandom, it, it's, they're not going to be easy teams to <laughs> knock to knock off. So um, to finish off our our talk here, and and th again, we want to thank you for for taking the time. Oh, this has been awesome. I'm honored. Um, but from someone who has as inside of a perspective as you did, not only playing the game, but but being a broadcaster for the Braves, can you tell baseball fans and Braves fans out there? Because everybody knows, like everybody knows, Acuna is going to be a factor, and Albies, and and Riley, and all these guys. But can you tell us one person, or maybe a, a piece of the team this year, that might fly under the radar, but is going to be a bigger part of their success going forward that people might not know of? Man, I think Jared Kelnick's going to have a huge year. I mean, okay. I, I so I got a chance to do the AL, ALDS two years ago with the Mariners and Astros. And the dude, the Mar yeah, the Astros swept them, but the Mariners had the lead in all three oh, yeah. of those games. Um, we're right there, we're tied. If you remember mm -hmm. that 18 inning game, dude, oh, when it was yeah. 0 0. My 14th inning, dude, 14th inning, my partner Brian Anderson looked over me and I'm like, I need some food, dude, or I'm going to drop <laughs> dead right here on this thing. Like, I got to eat. But, but you know what? I love for <laughs> him, okay? Two hours 30 minutes game. <laughs> yeah well exactly that's why i tell people when they're like oh you only had to do three games i'm like we did four bro it went to 18 innings that's two games uh but you know he's been he's so talented and so good but in in seattle right he was supposed to be the man supposed to do this supposed to do yep. that and it just he had some good moments and stuff but i just feel like it was whatever now he's going to come to atlanta right he's going to be in an outfield next to michael harris and Ronald Acuna in right field. It's like 
He's an unbelievable athlete. Go play gold glove defense. Then, as an offensive guy, he's not going to hit second in the lineup like Seattle did at times, or fifth or sixth. He's going to be hitting eighth or ninth in a loaded lineup where people are on base. And so I just think he's going to have the ability to relax, not have to be the man. You're going to have Austin Riley, Matt Olson telling him, dude, let us take the bullets there. You know, we've put up the numbers. We'll talk to me. You just go play every single day. And I've, I've talked to Snip, man. This isn't a platoon thing. They want him to take over that left field job and go. Because for the Braves, when Marcelo Zuna can just strictly DH and you keep Kelnick in there in the outfield, you got your best lineup, right, from a defense perspective in the outfield helping pitchers. That's one thing, too. If, if I'm a pitcher, right, like I look at that Braves defense and I'm like, man, yeah, you got, you got Albies at second, RC at short, Riley at third, Olsen. You got two studs in Darno and Murphy behind the plate to throw to, and then you got those three in the outfield. Like, freaking throw strikes, let them let them go make plays, you know. And so, I think he's a guy that really is going to be able to to take that next step. And I I also think the Braves' first pick from last year from Florida, uh, Waltrip or whatever, he yeah. he is he's got an arm, man. And he I could see that guy coming up halfway through the year this year whether it's, you know, as a starter in the bullpen and, and dealing. Because, right, that's, that's the big thing. I, I've told this to people. The Braves the last three years, their weakest team was the team that won the World Series in 21. Yeah. But they that's were crazy. also, as you know, they were also the healthiest team. And that's right. the biggest difference. The Braves have to find a way to go into October this year with Freed healthy, Strider healthy, Morton healthy. Now, if that means giving them each a blow on the IL, the fake uh, IL, as you like to call it, do it, right? Like, like rest those guys and make sure September, because that's been a huge thing for the Phillies the last two years, man. They've had Wheeler and Nola full health come into the playoffs, and it's made a massive difference. That's such well, a I'll good tell you, point. I'm the health is important, yeah. I'm jealous because you're rocking that P in there, and I am in Pittsburgh. And around here, we don't talk about anything but talent. Like, we have a ton of talent, right? And, but when you hear you talk about, it's like dynasty talk, how we're getting back there, not we're rebuilding. You know? And I think that's another thing, and I don't want to on a downturn because you've given us such great insight. And I, and I key it towards even these kids you know, who are trying to make it. I saw something you did on Instagram is that, how to develop and how to get noticed, um, even in the big leagues, like where you go and, and to get to that winning organization, right? There's this whole step and this whole process that everybody hopes in their life and their lifetime, the career to streamline. But brother, let me tell you something, man. It's I'm envious of you. I'm proud of you. I'm psyched to know you, call your friend, have you on the show because you're living, you're living a good life, man. Got a great family doing the Braves still and uh, a face of the, the franchise Still, even though you're behind that microphone, dude, it's so great to catch up with you, man. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, man. It means a lot. And it was so good to see you when you came down this year. And I cannot believe how freaking big yours is, man. I mean, he, <laughs> I he has got some serious size on him. I told, That ain't going to be a problem. I can tell you that. Size will not be his issue. But right, like, I'm sure it's fun for you to let your kid chase their dream. And, you know, I do that podcast with Pure Athlete, and the whole idea is, Go chase your dream, right? Like whatever that is, you know, whether it's golf, whether it's baseball, football, like just walk alongside them. And that's why I'm excited this year to be home a little more with my kids, be able to coach them and see that because, you know, as I saw with Jace when they came down, man, I mean, time flies and those kids get big quick. And and I can tell you this, Casey, I know you're a Mets guy, but I will say this, man, I cannot wait for the day that Pittsburgh gets rocking again because it is the best stadium in baseball, That's what I, I yes. people all the yep. time. When you were sitting there watching a game there and you got the whole stadium lit up. And look, those fans are dying to win. We see it with the Steelers. You see it with the with the, uh, with the the Penguins. Like, if you put a product mm-hmm. out there, they're going to come. And, you know. That's a sports town, man. It really oh, is. Oh, big it's, time. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. yeah so. This is a baseball town. I think, you know, you can't ever tell. I could never tell Case, hey, man, you got to spend your money on this or Frenchie, you guys spend your money on this. And even with ownership, it's uh, it's a storied franchise. It's just a shame that winning is the product that everybody wants to see, but they can't invest the way that all these other teams are. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, and, and I'm not knocking it. It's just, it's just truth. Somebody that wants to come in here and win, whether it's a Mark Cuban or an ownership group that wants to come in and say, 
yo, this has to change. And because yep. the Jolly Roger, the highest that was raised around here was back when, you know, the, the Pittsburgh city of Pittsburgh played the Cincinnati Reds because they didn't just play the Pirates that night. This town was cranking. We won that wild card game, man. And it was like, this Reds have no chance. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so 1979 is, is a long ways gone and we need to get some new blood. So hopefully one day I'm a fan too. And this city is great. But uh, in the meantime, like I said, I got all these jerseys behind me. I get to choose and cheer. I could be a front runner <laughs> and cheer for whoever I want to that I played for, you know. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. – I'll leave I'll leave you all with this. My favorite was last year during alumni weekend, you know. I was doing the home run derby when, when Jace was down there, and I was like, you know, hey, hey, kids, you know, Katie, my wife had ordered them jerseys and stuff, and only my two youngest. The other ones wore uh, – my, my 10-year-old thinks Olsen's the cutest thing in America, so she wore an Olsen <laughs> jersey. And my, my, my eight-year-old son loves Ozzy Albies, so he wore an Albies jersey. I'm like, can't even wear dad's jersey for one day, man. Like, come on, guys. They don't know. Too many superstars on that field, I guess. They don't. It's too Exactly. You're right. And I don't blame them. I'd wear those jerseys, too. <laughs> I love that's that. True. That's a that's a perfect way to end it. Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. We really appreciate it. Hey guys, thank you very much, and uh, hope to be uh, you know hope to be on again this year during the season, man. Appreciate what y'all are doing. Yeah, man, that's a lock, absolutely. Thanks, guys.